we're doing, and uh, then um, you know, hopefully you guys have some feedback or, or, or uh, some ideas for us. And um, certainly, what we want to make sure that you got is um, a little invitation that's it was in the swag bags. Uh, it's like like on an invitation paper. Uh, and um, what we do, my name is Forrest Stone. This is Annabelle Howard. We run a nonprofit educational uh, uh, publisher online, really, called Big Fun Education. So we're at that website right now. And um, <clears throat> I'll give you a little bit of background and then uh, show you what we're working on right now in response to the Common Core. And then, um, as I say, take, take questions and, and, and see if we can answer you know, any questions you might have about uh, how it might work in your particular situation. Um, I got into, Annabelle was a fifth grade teacher in New York City in the early 1980s. And I was a student at the Yale School of Drama here. And uh, when um, Annabelle was struggling to interest her kids in the Greeks and Romans, she couldn't do it with the tools she had. And <laughs> it was an epic fail for a while. And then she thought, well, maybe if the kids had a Greek play to bring to life some of these issues about life in antiquity, it would work. So we looked all around, and there was nothing that those kids could have read. So Annabelle turned to me and said, well, you're a playwright. And I said, yeah, but you're a teacher. And uh, so you do the work. No, you do the work. Oh, we got married after that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, you know, basically, we collaborated on uh, something. And the kids took fire with it so much that she, Annabelle had to kind of figure out how to teach her whole curriculum around kids supposedly rehearsing for a play. Then that well, became. Also, let me just add one other thing. Sure. I was at that school for two years, and then when I left, it had become so much a, sort of a part of the culture of the school that the fifth grade would put on a couple of plays during the year, and we would send runners to other classrooms to tell, fill them in so that there'd be an authentic audience and they would know about the gods and all the rest of it before they came, and not spoil the story, no spoilers, you know, this kind of thing. So the whole school was sort of became involved in this, and when I left... Um, and one kid got a role on a Broadway show. Yeah, <laughs> but, but when I left, uh, the other teachers were saying, oh, we want to, you know, we want to keep this going. So I had to, doc I had a training in, in theater, in education. Um, but I also have a very bad memory. So um, I had to take notes and create what I called stage frames, like little pictures of blocking all the way through the script. I could not remember what I said yesterday as to who came where and when and all that sort of thing. And what I found was that the kids would take my copy of it and run off and start rehearsing, or if I was talking to some kid about something else, suddenly they didn't need me. And I was just fine with that. And it's, it was real student-centered, student-owned, student-driven, because I had a bad memory, essentially. <laughs> so it came out of that. So I have had always to try and um, think of ways to make it work when you don't have, and, and the kids, the school did go on and keep, you know, keep doing that. Um, but make it work with um, fantastic English teachers who just haven't had that much experience with drama. But they know their kids love drama, but they don't want it to get out of control and become uneducational and become a star system mm -hmm. where people get upset. Or you know, they don't want it to go wrong. They want it to keep it educational, keep it in the center of the curriculum, um, motivate kids. But they don't really know so much about drama. Like you read a scene and you go, mm, okay, we read that. I yeah, what do I do next? So. so we, this so Annabelle's notes, Annabelle's notes became this series 20-some years ago on paper. And these sold all around the world. These sold uh, throughout the English-speaking world, 10 foreign countries and all of the states. And um, uh, the rights reverted to us in the early part of the century, in the 2000-something. Like, and then since then, Annabelle and I have started a nonprofit. We did something in Connecticut called the Connecticut Mastery Test League. It was an online learning league. We had about 10% of the state's kids preparing for the CMTs uh, through that. Of course, those are disappearing. So uh, we've been uh, looking for what we should do for the Common Core. And so we got a grant to, to study, well, how would we translate these paper products that we made all those decades ago into a 21st century thing 
that could really be alive for students today, A, and also B, specifically crafted for the Common Core. And we, we did a Google search of the Common Core standards for the word drama to see if it, you know, how relevant is it. And it is mentioned 43 times, and it's referenced over 70 times. And what, when you put the word reading into it, doesn't it you? Well, like spelling is referenced like five times or something, you know? Yeah, so it, drama is hugely important, but I don't think anyone's one's talked about it yet. That they, the Common Core is like this, oh, no, not another system. Oh, this is going to come and go. Oh, no. But if you look at it um, from a creative's kind of point of view, it's an absolute solid invitation to bring the arts back into the classroom. Right. It really is. You can just quote the standards if they, you know, if they want to see it. Why are you doing a play? That's not Common Core. Yes, it is. Mm. So we, we, you know, obviously we love that. Um, and I'm just hoping the word will get out so that people can feel free to get it up from their seats and, uh, and away from the computer a little bit. Although this is, you know, this starts as a digital thing, um, a play, unlike, you know, other things, a play is just a plan for something. It's like the blueprint for a house. You look at the blueprint, it's not the house. You look at a play, script, it's not the play. So... Yes, you have to start with something, whether it's on a page or whether it's in pixels, but then that kind of makey-makey thing comes into it, and it's not going to really become what, it, what it's meant to be unless the kids really own it, get involved in it, and start presenting it in one way or another. It doesn't have to be a staged thing with costumes, but they need to present and, and show their learning from it, um, see what sense they've made of it, cultural literacy or, or real-world connections or whatever it is they've got from it, they can show it. And that can be, you know, a festival, a, a theater festival, as far as, mm. as I'm concerned. So we labeled this to be, have to do with text complexity. And uh, there's a couple of ways in which, uh, um, or a couple of things to say about that. One of the things that we've done with each of these plays, I'll throw up the calendar of the events we're doing this year. As you can see, we're doing two titles at each grade of the Common Core grade bands. Uh, this year, and once these premiered, they're up forever. Because these things are so modular, by the way, I think some of your kids in K-5 could look at our Hamlet and Macbeth and some of the stuff that we nominally have for high school and maybe like work on one scene. Uh, the other or thing that we're doing, or one speech. Um, also, by the way, we've embedded a nonfiction in this as well. So, you know, the common core concern uh, with uh, looking at nonfiction, learning how to look at it more effectively, but still we're motivating kids with a story, a human story that can be, um, you know, that they can relate to. Uh, the other way in which uh, um, this is uh, the text complexity is an important topic here is that no matter how simple a script, uh, no matter how simple a language. Dr dr a dramatic text always exhibits all the features that are cited by the Common Core as defining a complex text. Why? Structure is one of the things they point to. And as you know, with a, with a play, um, just to get into one for, for just a quick second, just so you see what I'm talking about, um, in any play, there are character names and stage directions. You don't read those aloud. That's unlike poetry, unlike prose, unlike fiction. You know, so structurally, even at the most elementary level, a play script presents a structural challenge. It's structurally complex. The other things Com Common Core says about um, text complexity are that it places demands on knowledge and imagination. Well, a play. You know, particularly the classics uh, that we do um, require you to imagine a historical time and place that is not your own. We piloted this. I'll play you maybe a, a moment of a NBC covered the pilot we were doing in New Britain. In this play we did with them, it's called Life is a Dream. These two uh, people marry because they're, they're like from a royal family and it's like, to, you know, to unite the country. But they're cousins. And so the third, fourth, and fifth grade kids in New Britain were quite shocked that, that first cousins would be marrying in a story. And that was, but that was, to me, such an amazing thing to open up kids' eyes and say, hey, you know, throughout history, different cultures have been really different. 
you know, it's not all suburban Connecticut or even urban Connecticut. The, the world has had a lot of different kinds of cultures in it. Uh, finally, the, the, the um, uh, Common Core talks about text complexity in terms of levels of meaning. And once again, for the most part, this little play here, for example, is about uh, an American family that, move, that goes to England. We don't know if it's on vacation or whether they've moved there. The dad goes out for a walk one morning and hears the old poem, which is a riddle, as I was going to St. Ives, which is one of the text exemplars in the Common Core. It's a little riddle. So he comes back and, and tells his children the riddle and helps them solve it. Now, he doesn't just tell them the solution. He gets the kids to solve it. So even at that simple level, what we're talking about in terms of levels of meaning is not just someone in an expository fashion just telling you something. It's a character who's trying to pursue an objective. So um, if you think of more complex dramas like a Hamlet or Macbeth or something or Julius Caesar, there's a lot of things where people are lying. They're not saying what they mean. This presents a level of text complexity that is often unavailable, certainly in nonfiction, but, but uh, even in prose fiction, it's not as much the central thrust of storytelling as it is in drama. So I've covered the topic. I've done the good thing. The topic we said we were going to cover, text complexity, I just did it. <laughs> so, um, but it's also in what's not said. It's what's not said. The white space, uh, I taught playwriting at Yale for 25 years in the summer, and uh, the, the biggest thing to learn as a playwright or as a writer of dramatic texts is what you're writing isn't just the words, but what you're doing is you're crafting the white space. What happens when, that people don't talk about? What about the secrets they're keeping? What about the offstage events that you only learn about later? Um, and so let me see. Let me just uh, run back to... Oh, let me run back to the website. The other thing that's part of um, what we've baked into it is the vocabulary aspect. There's big emphasis in the Common Core. Um, and the robust vocabulary movement is talking about um, the three tiers of vocabulary, the everyday language, the academic language, which is you know the most important one because that goes across the curriculum, and then the domain specific, just you know words that come from math, that come from you know, biology or whatever it is, um, particular domains. So the research shows that kids who um, have transitioned nicely from 12th grade to college or workplace um, have learned about 400 uh, words a year starting in second grade. And vocabulary is one of those things that really has fallen between the cracks, I think, in American education. There's no sort of, I, there's no sort of like continuing portfolio of work that you do in vocabulary that travels with you so that you could say, yeah, I'm one of those kids, I learned 400 words last year, I'm gonna, they haven't gamified that. That's another proposal that we actually have in the <laughs> Department of Education. We wanna gamify vocabulary acquisition and, um, and let kids have a portfolio where they demonstrate use and knowledge of words and then it, it travels with them so the next teacher can see, you know, oh, you must be interested in coding because you know all those domain-specific words in technology or whatever. Um, I think that's a real missing piece. So how on earth, you know, the, the robust vocabulary movement is telling you, do not do that spelling test on Friday. Do not give them 10 words that you think are nice, that you think they should be, you know, that you've just pulled out of some book or whatever. Um, it's a whole other way of teaching vocabulary. First of all, it's got to be relevant to, co to real content that they're focusing on deeply. It's not just some piece of comprehension that they read once and it just comes across, oh, that's, oh, we've done that, we answered the 10 questions, done. You can't count that as vocabulary acquisition. You haven't had eight to 10 exposures of it over, over two weeks. That's what they're saying it takes to really deeply absorb a word and then make it part of your active vocabulary. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of, and you know, there just isn't a vocabulary teacher. So, you know, everyone's sort of done their little bit and hope that that's good enough. Now there's much more of a movement on teachers have got to get come together and really know what words so we can amplify each other's teaching and, and, and get together, perhaps not 
formally for lesson planning, but it would be good to share vocabulary. Well, these plays, we, we worked out that when they say 400 words a year starting in second grade, we worked it back down to what, how many words a week. And we're thinking 10 is a reasonable number because they're going to get words from other places. They're, you know, teachers are going to do other things. But if, if you work on our play and we did, we've put enough work in there to really keep you going for a month on each play, even though this play only runs just over three minutes, there's enough curricular work to keep you really engaged for a month. So we chose 40 words. We're figuring 10 words a week. Not that this is a recipe. If anyone says to me, how long do I have to do this and all that, I'd say, you know, what do you want to do? It's always about what you want, what your kids need. But just, in, just to sort of reassure you that it, that it is there, it's silently happening, sort of without you having to do anything, your kids will get, you know, the exposure over that time period that they say really makes it a solid learning experience. Plus, as, as I think you can see right now, um, we've color-coded those words. The everyday words are green, the academic words are blue, the domain-specific are red. And when you, they sort of pop up on demand within the script. If you don't want to pay attention to it, you just want it to be a listening experience to start with, listen. But then when you go back, if you want to click on a word, you get what we hope is a student-friendly explanation, not a definition. It, it, you know, it, it's common sense. If a, word, if a kid is struggling with a word and you throw a definition in front of them, chances are there's going to be five other words in that definition that they do, they don't, yeah. they're going to struggle with as well. I don't know kids that just genuinely have that impulse to go to the dictionary that they find that helpful. I just haven't seen it. I, I've never found it all that interesting myself. Um, you also don't really want to go away to a book these days. You sort of want it snap, snap, right there on the screen. So yeah, I should mention uh, that um, this, this software, what, 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 how it's going to work is that uh, uh, any given group, whether it's a classroom, school, or district, will have a URL that they can go to, one password everybody can use, and this, you know, kids, teachers, whatever, and uh, this software remembers where every device left off. So if there's a kid who's exploring some of this on their own or exploring some of the nonfiction pieces, which maybe you would assign to kids in particular, uh, you know, or have them go deeper on, uh, you know, if they leave that off at, on their PC at home at a certain place, when they come back to it, it'll be there. If a teacher is doing something in the computer lab or in a classroom, wherever they left off, it'll be there. So that was one feature we really liked about uh, the way this is designed. Um, and yeah, the funny little sidebar about vocabulary, we realized or read that dictionary definitions are so difficult and have that funny, weird style because they were printing a lot of stuff on, a, on paper. And of course, the discipline became how much information can I squeeze into a very short definition because we don't have infinite paper. Well, now we have kind of infinite paper and so, you know, you can be much more loose and explanatory with the way. I, I think this is a great definition for the word question. It's a sentence that asks for information. You know, that's not the, you know, that's not what you'd find in the Oxford English Dictionary, you know, uh, but it's a much more student-friendly look at it. Um, sort of back up for a second and, and, and tell you how this works. All the plays from uh, this primary grades, K, K1 play, all the way up to the stuff for senior high school, you know, we split it up in logical ways. We attach quizzes that are common core type qui formative quizzes. Text dependent questions. Text dependent questioning and media dependent if it has to do with pictures. Uh, attached to every unit in the play. So for Macbeth, for example, there's a quiz for every act, or a set of quizzes for every act. Um, and those, uh, you know, you can, a teacher can dip into, can jump out of, but they can use it in an active way. And the purpose of these quizzes, unlike, um, unlike th this is the thing we've really learned. I think Common Core is pretty interesting in that they're trying to get us to teach kids not a body of knowledge, but how do you look at material and derive knowledge from it. That's really the key difference, I think, in both language arts and math, is the common core in, in the old saying, 
is trying to teach us how, uh, teach us to teach kids sort of how to fish rather than giving them a fish, like that old saying. How do you look at any kind of table, his, history article, you know, uh, uh, multimedia piece, you know, how does the music play into it, all that kind of stuff. How do they look at all this kind of information that's coming at them, and what are the habits they can get into where they can, you know, reliably get meaning out of all kinds of media. So in our questions, usually the answer is right on the screen. The point isn't to test the kids. This is formative assessment. The, the point is to make sure the kids are getting these skills, you know, relevant to exactly what you you know what you're doing at the time. Um, now I uh, will restart that. Um, what did I promise to do? Should I play? What do you think I should? Play the NBC thing, or Would you like the, there's an NBC story that shows the kids in New Britain. It's about two minutes long. Yeah, it's under two minutes. There's sort of a backstage tour of the whole play, which takes about six minutes. So you get to see the features. The play itself is about three minutes. Yeah. I don't know what Any you're votes? Uh, Want to vote? <laughs> all of it. Well, this. I think, yeah, go. go. Uh, well, I was really impressed. I mean, I put in a well, plug well, for well, our. Well, you know what? Could you find that? Because one of the teachers was talking about fluency. Do you remember in complex text? But I don't know if you can find uh, it. I zoom in. Yeah, that's amazing, about an eight minutes. The three teachers that we work with in New Britain, and we chose New Britain because it tests has the worst test scores in the in the state. And so we wanted to make sure that we that this would work with everybody and be relevant for everybody. So we, we took a you know 17th century classic Spanish play. To these kids who were just testing way below third, fourth, and fifth grade, and I mean the the story speaks for itself. They mm -hmm. they went on like six weeks longer than we after yeah they we left. They wouldn't um, stop doing it. We we had, we were one to do the curricular stuff and to make sure that we knew how to package this, and then that was sort of what we we were done. <laughs> but the kids, the teachers told us the kids just won't stop doing it. They want to do it. They want to put on the play. So they built a set, they got costumes. But they'd never ever put a play on before, any no. of the three teachers. Yeah, none of the teachers had any drama experience at, at all. But yeah, I'll tell you that this piece was actually... At Big Y, education is top priority. Please join us and help... We should get Big Y school. as a sponsor. Sign up for Big Y's Education Express program and help us reach our goal of $3.5 million in school supplies. Inspire a child with every purchase. The third, fourth, and fifth graders at North End School have embarked on a journey to the 17th century. I will share the gym again because living is dreaming. Life is full of dreams. The classic play, Life is a Dream, by Calderon de la Barca, is their vehicle. Uh, this started as a project for studying the play, and then we decided that we're actually going to put it on. The work begins in the classroom as part of a pilot program developed by the nonprofit. Big Fun Education. Forrest Stone has been educating kids through plays for decades, but technology has now changed the game. It's enabling us to put that all on board on an interactive whiteboard right in front of the kids, right in the classroom, so teachers can interact with it. The lessons are geared toward the new Common Core standards. From the very beginning, a lot of it was just building vocabulary, building fluency development and a lot of comprehension skills. So at first I didn't know what, what was going on and then finally when we started doing the work and stuff and then that's when I started to get it and I was a genius at art as a genius. The visual radio play allows young kids to connect with the text. Why was it necessary to show that they knew that? What do you think? They started having a lot of discussions about Who's, who's who and who's related to the other one and you know everything, all the drama that was happening. Bringing the play to life on stage is the reward for their hard work in the classroom. I'm not dreaming. I'm where do I am? As they tackle literacy in a way we could only have dreamed of just a few years ago. Brad Drazen, NBC Connecticut News. Incidentally, all the way through that project, we um, gave the kids, and there were what, like almost 80 kids? About 80 kids. Um, in third, fourth, and fifth, and they collaborated to do this stuff. Um, we gave them monkey surveys every week, and um, we really asked them to criticize the process, the play, everything, the words that we'd chosen to focus on. 
Um, one of the questions we asked at, on the first week was, have you talked about this project at home? And uh, again, this is New Britain, you know, uh, urban situation, 69.5% or something, wasn't yeah, it? Was something 70 like percent uh, said after five days, that's, maybe they'd seen it three times. They talked about it at home already. Yeah, or shown the saw, shown this play to their um, yeah, the I've online play to their, gone online and shown parents it to their parents. And and that's you know text complexity or vocab pedagogy or whatever it is. I think getting the parents involved and, and having kids sufficiently motivated to carry that work that they did during the day to their home and and talk about it. That sort of trumps everything. Yeah, to the, me, that was like the best news. The I principal could have heard. was surprised. She she didn't even think that seventy percent of the families had internet access at home. You know, uh, that was her just, you know, sort of impression of the community she was serving. And it turned out that seventy percent of the kids showed the play to their, you know, to their families online. Days. So so basically, what you do, you know. It's. Uh, Why don't you just show that sort of backstage thing? I'll well, it does we take a. To, no, it's six minutes long, I think. Okay. We can cut Are you guys up for that? You want to. Sure. Okay. It's just sort of the okay. efficient overview, I think. Sure. I'm Annabelle Howard, the president of Big Fun Education, a non profit dedicated to memorable learning. I expect you're wondering how to begin this project. What I recommend is looking at the play first. The Common Core is encouraging us to let kids discover work, complex texts on their own, to let them struggle a little bit, to tolerate some frustration, to ask questions, and they don't want us front-loading. Uh, they don't want us to pre-digest, do pre-reading, all that sort of thing. They're looking more for what is referred to sometimes as the deep end approach. So let's just jump in. I suggest that you play the cast and setting first, and then scene one, and then scene two, and then scene three. The whole thing will only take perhaps five minutes. And then, when you go back over it again, you can pick up on other details. For example, you'll start noticing that some vocabulary words appear in different colors, everyday words being in green, academic words in blue, and tier three words, the domain specific words in red. When you click on them, automatically pops up a student friendly explanation of the word. If you like to have kids come up to the front to the whiteboard um, and interact, there's, there's plenty of room for that. When you go back over it, uh, perhaps after the second or third or fourth time, you can turn the sound down and freeze it on a, a slide and have the kids read that slide aloud. And in that way, you'll start structuring um, and giving plenty of opportunity to the whole class for reading practice, reading aloud, and building those fluency skills in a very social and fun way. As you read the play and listen to it, you'll notice there's an icon that is actually the cover of a book by Stanislavski. It's called An Actor Prepares. And Stanislavski was a Russian theater director who pioneered making acting more realistic and less stylistic. The way he made acting personal for actors is the way we're trying to make um, interacting with a complex text personal for your students. So when you see that icon, you see that book cover, you can choose to click on it and up will come a very short acting tip or acting exercise that relates to the part of the script that you've just heard. At the end of each part of the play, you'll see three boxes. These boxes correspond to the Common Core State Standards. And when you start one of these quizzes, you'll see immediately that the format is like the dreaded bubble test. But these quizzes can best be described as lesson plans in action. The questions are text dependent and the purpose of these quizzes is to get students to see the ways in which they must examine complex texts in order to create meaning. The point of a quiz isn't to test memory, but to strengthen comprehension skills in ways prescribed by the Common Core. And throughout these quizzes, 
there are 24 open-ended discussion prompts, which again we hope will get the kids talking about ideas related to the text. As you go through the play, you'll notice that there's a box called Real World that pops up. This is your link to eight non-fiction passages that relate to the play. The passages are very short. They come with audio, which, again, you can choose to turn off and you can read it instead at your own pace, asking questions um, that you think uh, need to be asked. Or you can have the kids listen to it several times. There may come a point when the kids are familiar with it where you might ask them to read certain parts of it or pick out vocabulary words. Whatever you're comfortable with, with doing comprehension uh, exercises, you can use these passages. If certain topics really inspire the kids, for instance, Riddle of the Sphinx, then you might let them take off and do a deeper research project from there. So again, let it go. Um, Beyond our control, let's just see what the kids do with it. Hi, this is Forrest Stone, co-founder of Big Fun Education, joining you on this backstage tour. From the contents page, uh, you can navigate the entire project. Here you have the digital play itself, the digital play audio only, and you have the common core of formative quizzes. Additional resources include a white paper about text complexity and drama, speaking and listening tasks that respond to the Common Core, and writing tasks that respond to the Common Core. Uh, also, vocabulary listed by tier and by scene. Then there's a collection of related content, including video and links to lots of other riddles and math poems for children. There's a suggested summative assessment, one for kindergarten and another for first grade. And also, among the additional resources, uh, is a collection of all the real-world nonfiction uh, in one printable document. Well, that's the end of the backstage tour. I hope you really enjoy the St. Ives question. Ta-da! <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? Any? Uh... Well, do they want to? Do you want to hear the actual play? Oh, that's Let's true. See how it? How it do you want to just do the uh, do it? Uh... Unless that you want to do something else. Anything else that? The cast, Bob, the oh, setting. Oh, you might still do the setting. setting. No, I like it the setting. It is four o'clock in England. Oh, how about this one? The Americans, <laughs> Bob and Kate, drink tea. Their children play. In England, the word tea also <laughs> means a light meal. Tea is served at four o'clock with tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's so English. <laughs> Scene one. It is four o'clock in England. Bob and Kate drink tea. Three children play. Did you have a good walk? Really good. Cornwall is beautiful. It reminds me of beaches in Massachusetts. He sips tea. Mm -hmm. Great tea. While you were out, you texted me. I did. I heard a riddle. Oh, fun. Tell me the riddle.
eight. Eight plus seven is sacks. Fifteen. No, no, no. Sacks aren't people. Don't add the sacks. How many means how many people? That is true. I met a man with seven wives. Well, a man can't have seven wives. He didn't say they were all his wives. Tell the story in your own words. See if that helps. Okay. A man went for a walk with his own wife and six female friends who were also married. Ah, uh, I think you are getting it. The kittens, cats, and sacks are not people. We mustn't count them. So it is eight. One man and his seven friends. Eight people went to St. Ives. Is that right? No. One. One person went to St. Ives. What? One person walked towards St. Ives. He or she walked in one direction and... Oh, oh, I get it. What? The man telling the story is walking towards St. Ives. The other man and the seven wives are walking away from St. Ives. So only one man is going to St. Ives. Yes. So, for, if you just froze it on that last... Yes. Yeah. So, for instance, in the third quiz, the green one, which is... What does it say that's about? Knowledge and ideas. Knowledge and ideas. Um, there, there are those, those standards ask you to get the kids to yes. explain how images relate to the text. So that last picture with all the footprints, that's, that's basically a prompt to summarize the logic of the riddle. You know, if you say, well, what, you know, explain... Can you explain why would they? What's that mean? How does that connect with the text? Um, you know, uh, kids can can respond to that at their, at their own level of sophistication. But you could even get kids to do it. You know, to act out how did they make that picture? And you know, there's just a lot of ways to sort of act out very simple parts of the play and get kids to have a sort of kinetic, you know, really engaged experience of it. So that's it. That's it. We've got 12 of these plays, and, um, they're, and they're all exemplar texts from the Common Core. And we're, we're, we've built a, um, well, built makes it it's a bit of an overstatement, but anyway, I've sort of gone onto Google Plus and started a community for teachers using this because my hope is, I mean, we're at the very beginning here. Um, but my hope is that teachers across the country will want to connect with kids in other places who are doing the same play so that, again, they can have an authentic audience. It's a lot, it's a lot more exciting to say to kids, look, at the end of, you know, on Friday, that project that you're doing connected with the play, you're going to present it to some kids in California or Arizona or, you know, wherever. Um, and they are going to talk to you because they're studying the same play. And they, can, they may be asking you questions about it. So we're getting into the speaking and listening part, the creating part, the collaboration part. And the um, use of technology. We had two Google Hangouts that we did during the pilot program. One was that we hung out, we did a mystery hangout with kids in the Ukraine because the play was set in Poland. Uh, so we wanted to try to find somebody in Eastern Europe who would talk with us. And that was really great because the two classrooms played a guessing game as to where the other was located. Those kids spoke English. They very quickly figured out that we were in America. But the next question was what state we were in. So they asked what crops are grown, and one kid said cotton, <laughs> which I don't think is grown in Connecticut. And it threw them off for a while. But the Ukrainian kids got back on the track. They, they, <laughs> they, they figured out we were in Connecticut pretty soon. Um, and the other one was... Uh, uh, something that we really want to uh, do more of. The, we had an, a friend of ours who's an actor in New York uh, did a key speech from the play, which again was set in Poland. He, he's of Polish descent and is, speaks Polish. And so he did that speech with a Polish accent and we put that online. So one of the features, it's not in this, uh, it's not in the primary grades plays, but all of these plays here are going to have a feature called Compare. So there'll be different ways of doing a speech or comparing a famous speech, let's say, from Hamlet with our version of that speech, that sort of thing. And we also want to uh, get not only theater experts, but other kinds of experts who are experts in the areas of nonfiction that we're going to be touching on. 
uh, to do Google Hangouts, and then we want, want to archive those so they become another library, both another way that people can interact and, and kids around the country who are doing this can interact, but also uh, sort of a library of interactions. So, for example, this play turned on astrology. So even though we ran out of time to do it, Annabelle had a Harvard astronomy professor ready to Google Hangout with, uh, you know, these kids from New Britain. Uh, it's great because you can get people uh, who are experts in many fields who are willing to spend 10 or 15 minutes sitting in front of their laptop hanging out with you know elementary school kids. Uh, so we want to make that part of this concept of a festival. So I hope you guys are all join in or get appropriate people at your school aware of this and to join in. We're, for uh, this conference, we're going to do a, a free, you know, one free classroom website. Basically, you know, we'll, we'll build a, a site that has a capacity for a class for, uh, for each of you. You can get started and hopefully we can get those sorts of interactions going and make a real snowball effect out of it and, uh, you know, get it, um, get it to be of interest for such experts to drop in and then also, you know, of interest for lots more kids around the country to do it. So, so thanks, thanks for listening. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.